me good. Yes. Boom! What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakyan. Very excited to be talking about sacred geometry and the Chestahedron. We have Frank Chester joining us on the show. Hello. Thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. We're super excited. We're very grateful to Brock Pierce for making the introduction happen. It was such a blessing going up to your home in Marin and being able to in dive deeper into all of your art and your sculpting and your sacred geometrical work. For those that don't know, Frank Chester is an artist, a sculptor, and a geometrician focused on the sacred Chestahedron. He has taught art for more than 30 years in high schools and colleges, exploring the relation between form and spirit. And you can find his link in the bio, frankchester.com. All right, Frank, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions we like asking our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? The direction of our world. Well, um, I think, first off, that the direction of our world is exactly where it's supposed to be, and I like it. And um, I'm pleased to be here, and uh, the capacity that I and everybody else has can develop here is a real gift. So living here on the planet between birth and death is, is the best. I'm, I would be happy to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You're very optimistic and yeah, I, that's very, very powerful. Um, I want to I wanna ask you about your journey now. Let's just jump right into it. Um, the amount of gratitude you had there was great. You're born and raised in Hollywood, California, and I want to know how you picked up your interest in art and sculpting and geometry. Well, um, <clears throat> my dad uh, taught me all these skills on how to make things. He could make anything, and now I can too. And so, being exposed to him um, had a lot to do with, with the whole thing. But I never thought I would be uh, an artist. But I've never, t I never had an art class in high school. On, but I got to uh, into college, and I was a force major, and I didn't like it, and so. I used to draw cartoons, and my roommate took cartoons to the art teacher and said, hey, look at this guy can do. So our teacher said, hey, send him over. So I went over, and I really liked him. And so I started and changed my major to art. I graduated. I went to Cranbrook Academy of Art for uh, my MFA, which was a, one of the top three schools in the nation at the time. So that's kind of what happened. And when you were with your father and you saw your father being able to build whatever that he wanted to create it, and then that inspired you as well to be able to start tinkering and playing. What were you most interested in tinkering with when you were young? With him? Yeah. With my dad? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my dad, um, he was such a craftsman. I mean, when he made something, man, that thing was beautiful. And so I always competed with him. Whenever I could, I tried to compete with him to do as good as he could. And only now can I. But it took me so long to get as good as he was. And so, of course, we made model airplanes. Uh, model airplanes. Model airplanes. And I was in, in, a, in these big uh, state and national contests with gliders. And, um, and I won uh, uh, awards with that. And then... When I got to be about 16, and my dad says, okay, how about a hot rod? I said, okay. And so he and I built a hot rod, and um, I drove that to way past after I graduated from college. So, you know, between the airplanes and the cars, uh, it was a great, it was great teenager life. I had a great teenager life. Those are both very strong um, uh, ways of understanding our world is being able to craft things by hand as well as go for both the model airplane side of things as well as the cars. Those are good ways of understanding how things work. Wow, it sure was good for me. Yes. It was. And then um, also you, I, just 30 years of teaching in high school and colleges. How did you then, was it, was it partly about your father teaching you that you got inspired to teach others as well? 
Well, no, I mean, during those, those teaching years, um, I was teaching art and industrial arts. So I could use the machines and apply them artistically, where the artists couldn't use the machines, they didn't know about them. Ah. And the industrialist people didn't know how to design. So I came right in the middle between those two extremes. And uh, I, I think that's really what really helped me. And so when I got started, to I didn't really plan to be a teacher. And I didn't like it at first, but I got to a point where I just loved it. And what I did is I decided that one day that I had all these ideas and I thought, why don't I just give them my, to my students? So I gave all my creative energy and all my ideas away. And more, you couldn't believe the results I got and you couldn't believe how much it helped me, not only the students. So this is interesting how you both had a, uh, a solid footing in the idea of building in manufacturing a car, uh, a plane, but also on the design and art side of things. Right. When, when at times some people can go deep into one of those two, you were able to find a strong... Yes, I middle. found the middle ground. Yeah. And I needed both. Yes. I needed both. And that's how you can build things. Into, yes. the, into the yes. reality as well. Um, That's right. And then you, you also, um, you mentioned then this, you know, this process of, of figuring out that you want to teach, that you want to open source even your ideas. I did. Yes. Tell us about this. Yeah, uh, it was really great because if I had done it just by myself in my studio and, you know, made the art and whatever, um, the ideas wouldn't have come as quick. And I wouldn't have seen things being developed Okay, so that I could, I could do something else. I could have a question about something, and then when I would see it being made, I would have better questions about it. And so my questions got better. Oh, it was a great journey. Really great. Yeah. It's, you opened up the information flows and let other people build on top of them, build... Uh, yeah, new, new and I got to see them develop. Yeah. And what were some of your favorite aspects about the 30 years that you spent teaching? Like the young people, what did you find most interesting about those teaching processes with them? Uh, that I could put life in, back into teaching, into school, and I could, I could uh, invigorate, I could motivate, and I could take the dullness out of all the experiences I had in school. Because I went through those, I never allowed the students to become dull. And I, I, they were very enthusiastic. I used to hang around on my door. I used to run to my class. So that, that's really nice. That was great. Yeah, that's the yeah, pi that's pinnacle great. teaching is when the kids are running to the class because they're so interested. Yeah, you, I ran away from the class. <laughs> All right, let's talk about how you picked up sacred geometry. Actually, when we were at your house and you said that, oh, I only um, picked up the sacred geometry uh, work 20 years ago, and that was when you were 60. Yes, that's right. Yeah, um, what happened is I retired, and um, <clears throat> I really didn't know what to do, but I did know I wanted to go back to school. So I had already taken so many art classes, well, why don't I do something else? So I decided to take a science class. And in this science class, the lady who was teaching form studies introduced the whole class to platonic forms, which I hadn't heard of. I mean, of course, I've heard of a cube. You know, everybody knows what a cube is. But I had no idea there was any kind of um, deep thought behind it. I had no idea. So when I started, to look at these five forms, especially the cube. Uh, and I was very interested in the cube because the cube is, is basically everything that's different. And, and that's based on the earth. So the earth experience we have here, okay, is based on the cube and the quality of being different. So um, I started to study these platonic forms and the first one that came into the world is a tetrahedron, that's four triangles. And then the second one that comes in is the octahedron. Well, that's all triangles too. And it seems like the last one that comes in is the cube. 
So I started to figure out, well... And the cube has no triangles. What's that? And the cube has no triangles. It has what kind of? No, no triangles. What do you mean? No, no triangles on a cube, all squares, right? Yeah, everything's 90 degrees. Yes. No triangles. Um, and so my first idea was is to put the first form, which is a tetrahedron, and put it into a cube. And I did, and I thought, my God, that's really neat. So then I went from the uh, cube to the octahedron, and I noticed that they would go in each other, and also uh, they were opposites. And that really perked up my interest in it. So I have a, a cube, here's the cube, and here's an octahedron. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these are polarity difference. These are opposites. Okay. And the reason is is because this comes from here. Okay. And it will go into the cube like this. You can put the top back on. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Okay. 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 So the form inside is the opposite of the one outside. And the reason is is because the cube is all planes. Yes. And this is all points. Yes. Yes. So points and planes are opposite. Points and planes are opposites. And this one they are. And so there's a point here and there's a plane on the inside, on the face of the, the tetrahedron. Yeah, I mean or the octahedron. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. Well, what happens is that when you take the cube and you cut this corner off, in that corner? Yeah. It yeah. makes that shape. Exactly, yes, yes. When you cut it at this plane level, it makes that shape. That's right. Yes. These are called truncations. Truncations, okay. So you cut the corners off. Yes. And you get that inside. Exactly, yes. Now, if you take the one inside and you cut the top off, which are the points are called vertices, but I'll call them points. Yes, yes. If I cut the points off, um, it makes a cube. Yes, yes. And then if uh, if I cut the if I cut these points off, okay, then uh, it becomes a cube, and then a new one of these can go in that cube by cutting off the cube again. So it can go all down to yes. infinity and all the way huge. So this is a polarity. This is, this is uh, an opposite. Mm -hmm. This is an opposite of this. Okay, a okay. polarity. So okay. this is what's really neat about this. This has, this has six points, six vertices. And this has six planes. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, but this has eight points. Uh -huh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's eight. And that has eight planes. Mm. This has eight planes. See how wonderful that is? Yeah, yeah. That's just unbelievable. So, this is based on eight. And this is based on six. Mm -hmm. Because it has six points, this has uh, eight points. Mm -hmm. So, six and eight. So when I saw this going on, I said, well, where's the seven? Ah. Because it's gotta be, you know, between, between eight and six, or six and eight, there's gotta be seven. So I went to the instructor, I said, you know, <laughs> where's the seven? And she says, there isn't one. I said, what do you mean there isn't one? <laughs> it's a six and an eight, come on, give me a break, you know. So I said, well, I said, in between these two, there has to be a seven. And she says, well, in between these two is this form. So this is halfway between the cut and the corners off. And this makes a 12-sided form. Uh -huh. So that's not helping me all, at all because I want the seven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after that class, uh, I was inspired to work on seven, so that's all I did. 
is to work on seven. So since there wasn't one, I thought, well, I know there's eight points there, or eight points here and six points here. Why don't I make seven points? That makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So what I did was I took a I took a seed that I found outside my apartment and that seed maybe I have it over here. No, I don't see it. But Is it in one of the I'll look ones? again here. Let me look and see if I could find that seed. Oh, here it's it right is. Right there? I got it. Okay. I love how interactive this is. This is an amber, an amber seed, amber tree. And it had all these little holes in it. I thought, oh, this is perfect. So I took seven sticks the same length and I put them in these holes. Mm. Um, like this. And I tried to keep them equal distance apart, mm -hmm. you know. So that one would be, you know, that would be try to keep this equal and that's not Correct. quite equal. And I kept going around and keep adjusting them until I put seven together. That were equidistant. Oh, yes. Again. yes. Thank you. Yes. Some of these little poke holes don't hold it too good. All right, there's seven sticks. Okay. They're all the same length and I, I got them all the same distance apart. I can see that I need to put probably one here. See, I'm already doing it. I'm already starting to do this again. And so I connected all these points. Like, these are connected. You know, these are all connected, right? And the shape I got had 10 sides. A seven sticks makes 10 sides? I thought, what's going on here? Something, yeah. Yeah. this is going to be more difficult than I thought. All right, so I put this aside and I went back to studying the difference between these two. Now here's a cube and here's an octahedron. Okay. These are, these are minerals. This is, this is um, uh, uh, this is uh, fool's gold. Fool's gold. This is fool's gold and it, and it forms into a perfect cube, pyrite. And this is, this is feldspar, and it works into a perfect octahedron. There it is, there should be a seven though, you know, in minerals. But the, I found out there isn't, because seven doesn't spiral. It doesn't grow. Crystals grow like this. But the seven turns. Ah. Uh. So that was really cool to what I found out. Now you can see here's a feldspar here. And you can see that it has these purple parts right here. It's already trying to become a cube. See how you cut the things off? That's natural. Okay, the seven is not natural. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a pen here and show you about seven. Mm -hmm. And I discovered the, I discovered the chestahedron had to have a difference between here that made sense. And nothing in geometry made sense. And, uh, and Frank, we can, ang we can angle it towards ahead. this one. Yeah, okay, we're good, okay. So first I'll, I'll put, um, uh, I'll draw a cube. Uh, the octahedron is a little harder to draw because it has so many sides. Uh, it's basically like this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah? Yeah, yeah. All right, so here's the question mark. What is this? Mm hmm. Yes. Between yeah, the that, six that, and the that's eight. That's the question yeah. mark. Yeah. So, that is basically what I wanted to show you. Um, but I think I better show you how I found this. Mm -hmm. So, I started by showing you. I put seven sticks in mud, or in us, into that piece of clay, or into that seed. Well, 
As you can see, I didn't work. So I'm going to show you how I did it. This will show you how I found this form. Mm -hmm. So you can't take traditional geometry and cut corners off and truncate them. Doesn't work. So something had to be different that hasn't been done in the world before. Okay, so the next thing I did was I took seven fishing floats. They're kind of half white and half red. I don't know if you've seen them. And I put seven of them together like this with my hands with a piece of clay in the middle. This is what I got, which is pretty cool, but that's just not seven. I mean, it's got seven holes, but the problem is it's got this big gap here. See that big gap? Yeah, yeah. That ball and that ball and that ball and that ball, when you push them together, they can't, they don't touch. Yes, yes. So there's a big gap here too. Well, that's not gonna work. So what I decided to do is instead of working from the center to the periphery, I started to go from the periphery to the center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I took a ball of clay. I knew where the seven points were because I already done it. Uh -huh. So what I did is I started, I'm a sculptor. So what I did is I started to carve these holes, these volcanoes into a sphere, mm -hmm. seven volcanoes. And this is what I came up with. But the, 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 the only way I could have done that is because of this gap here, and artists don't care about gaps. We just keep carving. And this one turned, turned in differently because when this came together, this is what the shape looked like. This is the actual one I did 20 years ago. So when I carved in here, one of them became a triangular and one of them became force. One, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four. And I thought, wow, why aren't they all the same? Then I never thought that a triangle and a four is seven. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So then I made this into planes only. Here are the planes. Okay. So the first plane that I dug out, huh, there's a triangle, right? And then when I carved out the other one, it became this shape. And here's, there's the triangle, or the, there's the quadrilateral, and there's the triangle. That's a seven-sided form, right there. Seven-sided form has four and three. And this has four triangles and three quadrilaterals, seven. And this surface and this surface are perfectly even in square footage. Ah. Perfect. Uh -huh. And it has seven points. So my original one with the seven points worked out pretty good. But there were, when I made the, the, the seed with all the toothpicks in it, there was a problem because I had to take away three of them and make them shorter. But which ones? So through the process, I found that you saw one process that I took the ch I took the tetrahedron. Here's the tetrahedron, and I have a stick here somewhere, maybe. Yeah, I put that stick in here, all the way down to the bottom, and I put it back in the cube. That stick lines up with one of the corners. Yeah, and this is the corner here. But the top, okay, you know, this edge here, this edge here, this is root two. This is root two, that's root two, this is root two. All over is root two. That's amazing. All right, so what I did was, is I got a video that shows this. What I did was I opened up the top of a tetrahedron which has never been done before. Nobody's ever done this. I opened up the top of the tetrahedron and this blue shape started to appear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there it is, the tetrahedron inside a big tetrahedron. Now when I opened it up, 
you can see that blue shape. There. Mm -hmm. There it is again. Mm -hmm. So that surface that you see is green there, but now it's coming in the green lines, is exactly, I stopped at exactly when it was equal to a triangle. So look, watch it being reduced. See it reduced and reduced uh, to one. Now it's both, all of them are one. Yes. So that's one, that's one. I knew exactly where to stop. So, this is where to stop, the blue. Mm -hmm. I stopped for the blue. Well, the chest the tetrahedron opened up like this, and when it got to be an equal surface with this, I stopped. If I continue to open this up, this blue would become twice the size as the red. It would be two triangles, one on top of the other. And what's interesting about this is that this fits into a cube, just like the tetrahedron, except it's been twisted. So instead of being like this, yeah, this is good enough. Instead of being all the way to the corners, yes. I twisted it. And when I twisted it, it opened it up. And now the blue touches here, all seven points touch the form, touch the cube. And that was the beginning of the chetahedron, how I found a seven-sided form that had all the qualities that I was looking for, for a seven. So then I'll go back and show you this. So just a heat looks like this. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this had points, right? This had eight points. Mm -hmm. This has seven. This has six. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this form has eight triangles. So they are like have eight triangles. I used four. Yes. One, two, three, four. Yes. One, two, three, four. On this side, I use these kites. Yeah, yeah, you call them kites. Yeah, they're like little kites. Yep. And there's three kites. And there's three of them. One, two, three. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That makes four times three is twelve, right? Yes. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. This also equals twelve. Mm -hmm. This has 12 edges. Mm -hmm. It has 12 edges. This has edges also. 12. Mm -hmm. This has 12 edges. This has 12. This has 12 edges. Yeah. I, I, I mean, give me a break. You know what I mean? I start with sticks and mud instead of <laughs> a little seed. I mean, I, it's, just, it's just insane what my life has been like going through this. It's, it's, just, it's just been fantastic. So, um, the, to see this, this numeral abstraction happen yeah. from a form I found subjectively, yes. okay, yes. is the direction I've been going for the last 20 years is to study where this is. Okay. So one of the things about it is this. So for, so for platonic shape solids, there was no seven. All right. They, I was introduced to it through, they were solids. And when I saw them, there wasn't anything solid about them. I saw them as edges only. I saw that the inside was empty. Okay, and so that's the way I approach it. How I was able to start this, this whole idea is going into the center and going out to the periphery yes. and going from the periphery back into the center. And then I found the center. So I can show you another thing that's really neat. This is the octahedron and this is the cube. Mm -hmm. Now the octahedron and the cube are made up with three planes. And they're both are all the same size. 
So these are opposites. So in between here, there has to be the 7, 2 that's being done. So there's 3 here and 3 here. They're all the same size, except they're a different configuration. This has taken the square and gone across it diagonally, which is root 2. This one has taken the square and crossed it. So this is actually a plus and this is a multiplier. All right, so if I take these and I put them together in the chest of heat, it looks like this. Okay. So this has three, one, two, three. There are four, four sides, four quadrilaterals, and it has the other ones, which are dealing with the cube. They also have four sides. So all together, this is 24, this is 12, and this is 12. And it's right in between. And the thing is beautiful. I think it's just gorgeous. This is an interval. My work is all about intervals. An interval. I never realized that that's what that is. I, this, this form represents how to balance polarities. Ah, okay. So this is, in music, this is an interval, and you can't hear, you can't have music without intervals. And intervals, you can't see them, and you can't hear them. You can only feel them. Wow. So an interval is my work, and this is an interval form. Okay, so, so I'll get more and more into this. The balancing of a polarity. Yes. You got two notes, what's in between? An interval. If you think of pianos, it has black keys, those are intervals. Mm. They're half notes. Mm -hmm. There's an infinite amount of those what's half. That? There's an infinite amount of those half. There's yes. The, yes. Well, there's also quarters. Yes, quarters. And yeah, 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 all, yeah. yeah. And Eight, it keeps ten, down. Yeah. Twelve. So. And you found the interval between the six and the, se uh, the eight. That's an interval. And then that's, nobody has ever found that. So, so I thought I'd do a little sacred geometry. I was going to do it at the very start, but I think I got involved with this being in front of me that I just kind of didn't start like I wanted. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this form you see in front of you here is sacred geometry. And why is sacred geometry? It's because it had nothing to do with mathematics. There's no abstraction. It came from sacred geometry. Sacred geometry consists of three things. A pencil, a straight edge, and a compass. Mm -hmm. This is the first compass in the world. It's a twig oh. with a branch. Wow. This is how it started. To make a perfect circle? This makes a perfect circle every single time. Now the Egyptians, 4,000 years ago, they would take two people and they'd tie a rope between them around their waist. <laughs> and one would go around the other. <laughs> That's how it used to be? Wow. And then when he got to where he started, there's this guy's turn. And he went around the other way. Wow. Yeah. And it came two circles. So, this little guy here, all you have to do is take your son or daughter down to the beach and find an old dead stick around with a branch off it, break it off, and put it in the sand, and you can draw the most fantastic sacred geometry in the world mm -hmm. without using a ruler. You just need another stick. So I decided, you know, to really show this, I thought I would um, put a, kind of an end on here so um, it's now got something I can mark. So if I, I'm going to show you everything, I'm going to show you a whole thing based on this stick. All you need is a stick mm -hmm. with a branch, one little branch off it. So if I draw a circle here, Awesome. That can be easy. 
but it's hard to keep that point. You know what I did? I put a, an eraser on the end of my compass. Oh, to keep it? It didn't, yeah, yeah. It didn't move around, so yeah. we're going to have kind of a mess here for a while, maybe. Yeah, it still moves around. But if I draw one circle here, see, I want to use this stick to show you that this is all you need. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if I draw, if I go across here, means I took a bunch of points. Yes. Center points, and connect them. That makes a line. That's the first thing that comes into the world is a line. The point is in a dimension. That's the first dimension. Okay. Anyway, so then if I go out here and I do it again, if I draw another circle. Okay. I forget this guy, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is known as one. Okay? One. That's the first I meant one. But here there's something else going on because right in between these two we have another line. And we want to know what that, that line is. Mm hmm so, you know, I did it freehand, but I, if I use the stick, this is how I would do it, right? I use a stick. Now, this is accurate. If I had done it a little better with a, a real compass. A real compass. Okay, this is consciousness. This is the sign of consciousness. And this is polarities. And in between here is the interval. Okay, so, okay, okay, so the, the polarities are the two separate ends of a compass and the interval is in between them. That's right. Okay. So this should be one. And it is. My stick drew one. Mm hmm. So that means that there's something else going on in here, okay, that is going to happen because this is accurate. All right. So, if I make a stick as long as this one here, this is supposed to be more accurate. But if I bring this to a point, not a point, I mean it is. I'm kind of disappointed that's not as accurate as I wanted, but I had the tetrahedron with the cube. Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah, there's this one, but I had one in a cube. Well, anyway, believe me that this red line, okay. The, the tetrahedron in the cube, right down there. Yeah, I had one with the stick in it, oh, remember? Oh, yeah, it's right here. I got it. It's right here. Uh, here we go. Well, that's not that. that. That's okay. But I had one I could remove the stick. Nope, not over there. This one? But I had one that you could take the stick out of it. Here it is. Okay, let's see if this is any closer. I hope it is. Because I'd like to get this, even though I used that. That's a little shorter. Okay. So if, I'm telling you this is perfect. Except my stick isn't... I think the reason is, is because I added the eraser and the circle got a little smaller, or bigger. If I don't add the eraser, let's see what it, what it was like. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah, with the eraser got a little bigger. Might have been a little bit smaller. Ah, uh -huh, see, there we go. If I make the circle correct, yeah, without that eraser on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the red becomes smaller. But that's because of this instrument. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I should do it again. Let's see. Oh, they're not going to, you're going to go off the paper. I think we will. Maybe we won't. That'll be all right. Well, no, that won't work. 
and go, uh, sure, let's do another one. No, but try, try, try to put it. the point there. Okay. Uh, put it about here, maybe there. Yeah, okay. Now remember, this is with the stick. I'm twig, I got off the beach. Yeah. Okay. All right, now let's see. Let's see if this gets any better. There it is. Yeah, now, there it is. Okay. I well, can see we just had a twig problem. We had the eraser at the end, yeah. yeah. Eraser problem. Does that, does that, can you see that that's accurate? And what does that tell us? Okay, what does that tell us? That tells us that that distance is exactly between these two points in a cube. Ah. Remember we had this. This part, mm -hmm. this part, see how it's accurate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that line brings in the third dimension. That's how you get the third dimension. And that's where all these protonic forms come from. You can see it, that that's I had that little third, stick in there. That's how you get the third dimension. Yeah. So the, so the first is this line. The first is the line, that's the first dimension. The first is the line, yep. and then the second. The second, so you want to know where the second is. All right, let me show you. This is the second dimension. Okay. It's a plane. Okay, yeah. watch, watch this. Yes. Look, it's the same size. Yes. Same size as my circle, right? Okay. The is that plane, right? Yeah, the plane. The plane is, and then here's the line on that circle that we were just... Yeah, this, see the red line? And the red line is the third dimension. The red line is the third dimension. Because it can fit in the... Is this in the in cube? In a cube. The cube? It's the diagonal in a cube. It's the diagonal in a cube, and it's known abstractly as root three. Root three. This is one. So... That's root three, so where's root two? Is the plane, no? Uh, the? No. No, root one is this? Yes, well that's one. Oh, one, one, where's root two? Yes, where is root two? Is, is this red line? No. no, no, that's root three. That's root three. See, look how I have that root three, see, look it. Yeah. Isn't that great? It's great, yeah, yeah. yeah. I did that with a stick. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm trying to tell you here is that this is um, sacred. Where's the root two? Okay, well, let me just show you one more okay. thing and then I'll tell you where it is. Okay. Okay, so look at this. There's root three again. Mm -hmm. See that? See how it is? So if I go like this, Watch this now. There's root three. Yeah. Right on. That's magic. That's absolutely sacred. Unbelievable. Who did this? This has been known for thousands of years. Okay, root two. All right, uh, I drew this one here. I won't, I'm not gonna try to make this accurate, okay? But it is accurate. This distance right here is one. All right, if you take this distance up here and this distance up here and you draw it across, it makes a perfect square. Yes. That's root two. Oh, root two is, a, so root two is the diagonal on a plane squ square. Square. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. Isn't that amazing? This is a <laughs> stick, you know. I got off the beach. That's amazing. <laughs> so Absolutely that's why amazing. it's been able to be done for thousands of years. Thousands and thousands of years. Don't give me a break. I don't need all this abstraction. All I need is an old stick off the beach. And your son or daughter can make these circles and make these circles and make these circles. Now, and what's the significance of, of, of one, root two, two, and root three in terms of how it applies to our everyday life? 
it is what everyday life is made of? Well, that's a good question that you have to kind of find your own answer to. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm going to do something else that I, I, this is, to me, this is amazing. Now, I, ha I have to do the eraser again. Okay. Because maybe that's a little bit better. So, if I draw a circle, I make a point, here's the point, and I draw a circle. Now, a lot of you know this already. Yeah. That's good, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not bad, huh? Yeah, pretty good. Okay, so if I go like this. For a twig off the beach. What's that? For a twig off the beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and with an old eraser on the thing. Yeah. <laughs> and some magic marker thing. Yeah. But if I go around this, remember this is the same distance here. Yeah? Okay, okay. Oh, I see where, okay. Mm-hmm. That thing's still trying to come off. Won't be as accurate as I would like, but I want to use the stick because it's important to realize that sacred geometry is all about this stick. Awesome. Anyway, it's and supposed to be out the, the same. Simplicity, yeah, yeah. Okay, now. Okay, so we made six markings around the... Six markings are perfect. If I made them all perfect. See how that didn't quite make it? But it's very close. That's yeah, because yeah. of the where the compass was. There it is. Okay. Yeah. Now, in sacred geometry is has a moral force. And what I mean by that is that the compass is a moral compass. And why that is is because you can't cheat, you can't lie. It's the truth. Mm. Absolute truth. So if I make another circle around here like this, you know, it, it should it should be something like this, right? Oh, uh ha! -huh, look, look how it hits there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this thing is. I go around here like that. Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's about right. Yep. Everybody sees that, huh? We did that already. All right, I'm going to do it again. You're intersecting another circle with the yeah. with the ver So this is exactly, huh? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to do it again. So now, there is no uh, cheating or lying. It's only true. No cheating. No no cheating. Everything. Wherever a line crosses, is where you put the compass. Yeah, yeah. You you can't cheat. This this kind of work changes your dream life if you do it. So there's it changes your dream life. Yeah, it'll change your dream life. <laughs> well, how does it change our dream life? It makes, if you have unlawful type of dreams, oh, wow. nightmares, whatever, Yeah. this takes care of that. Ron, you should uh, do some of the, this practice. Just you. this. Now, this is what a kid can do. So if I go around all these points, yeah, and... The, uh, I'm not going to be real accurate because I'm using this stick. But you know in the sand, oh, it's right on. I mean, you don't have this eraser thing. It's right on in the sand, in the play box, or in the mud, whatever. And that's the... So here we go. And that's what you're showing right now is... Let's make sure the NDI is on. It is. Okay, excellent. And what, what, yep, there it is, what we Google searched. Yeah, there it is. See, see this, this little star here? That's the one right in the middle there. That's this one. And so, so that's let, the but I made this with a stick, okay? You made it with a stick. I made it with a stick. So you can see this, all right, see, see the circle? It's important that you see them. I haven't put all the circles in. I mean, after all, I'll be here all day with a stick. But <laughs> there are six circles, right? With one in the center. That's seven. Ah, six circles with one in the center. Six markings on the edges, one down the middle. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's many. There's seven. Okay, so and that's, this is the main, this is the flower of life, what you've 
made. And then the more that you make markings, you can keep going from here, make another circle. That's right. You could only put this compass point, okay, that point, where two lines cross. Where two lines cross. Here, you can only keep going from here, from here. That's right. And then what is this repeating pattern of the flower of life? If you keep repeating this out. Okay. Yes. This makes seven circles. If I do what Alan said to do, I will get 12 other circles. Okay. 12 and 12 and 7 are 19. 19, yes. 19 is a big deal. 19 is a big deal. But 19 is the flower of life. This is the seed of life. We went from 1 to 7 to 19 if we yes. do another layer. 19. What, and, and obviously 7 is the amount of sides on a chestahedron. Yes. And then what's 19? Why is that such an important? Well, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with this because it's simpler. Okay. Yeah. This is the, you said this is the seed of life. This is the seed of and life. And 19 is the flower of life. Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, wherever these, I think it's best if I mark, you can really see with the yellow, what I'm yeah. talking about here yes, with yes. the sacred geometry. Do that. Okay. Okay. Wait, wait, let's keep it a little longer for, for the viewers. Yes, okay. Find my stick. Here's my stick. Okay. So, this is what's really neat, is if I, if I connect these points, if it was really accurate, and it's, you can see that one's accurate, you yeah. can see what oh, I'm wow. doing. Wow, this is cool. You know. Okay, okay. Ah. Ah. <laughs> ah. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> With an eraser. There's a six pointed star. Yeah, so this six this six pointed star is by continuing to take the where where the uh the edge, the, these edges, these verses. Wherever are. two lines cross. Wherever two lines cross, and then you, uh, and you're making a line from where two lines cross to the exact yeah. opposite to the. Okay, okay. That's right. Now, not only not only that, but I can do this. I hope you don't mind if I do it freehand. I I want to do it freehand and make it quick. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll do the best I can. Okay, and then you're connecting those, yes. Okay. Okay. So, from here to here, is from here to here. Yeah. So, you're, what you're showing us right now is the exact cross section right I there. Am. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That the Chestahedron would have this in yeah, the center. Yeah, that means you're onto it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, what is this all about? <laughs> so what I did was this. I, I took uh, my bigger compass here. Interesting. So the cross section of the Tetrahedron is the, uh, the seed of life. That's right. That's, that's pretty, is that that's cool pretty, or what? Badass right yeah, now. yeah, this is getting better all the time. You know. <laughs> so if I draw a circle around this, okay, and, you know, if it was accurate, you know. It's oh, not, here, oh, here's your bigger, uh, here's your bigger uh, compass. Yeah, so, all right, so anyway. These compasses are so cool, these oh, this is a this is a really cool compass. Unst instead of most compasses have a <laughs> most <laughs> compasses have a, a, a 
Oh, you know what it is? It's the wrong top. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You got it. Uh, most companies have a. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Yeah, yeah, they have a, a, a bar here with a screw, and you can go like this. Oh, yeah, to adjust And, it, and yeah, it goes yeah. like that, right? Yes. This doesn't do that. This does this. And then when you want to get it really accurate, you use this. And this moves the pan. Wow. Oh, my, it's much more accurate than anything on the planet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, that's why I have it, because I have to be very accurate in yes. my work. Okay, so you drew us another circle around where these are. For, for, yeah, Could, keep, explain that. Why? Why did you do that one? Now, what the, do you this mean? This last, this last circle that you drew. Yeah, it's a, the main thing to realize is that is a circle. Yes. And that that helps you get it accurate. Okay. And when they show the seed of life, okay, they don't have this out here, but they have a circle around this. Know what I mean? Yeah. It's like this one here. See, what's, this, is the fruit, this is the fruit of life that's behind here, this big one. And it has a circle around it. Fruit or flower. Huh? Yeah, fruit and slash flower. And this is the fruit or okay. seed of life. Okay. And this is the flower of life. Okay, okay. Now, to make this, all you have to do is connect all these points, which we talked about. Okay. So this is the most recognized as the most sacred of all uh, sacred geometry, this one. Why? This has, this has been found in places that are 10,000 years old. They're in the, they're in the temples uh, in Egypt. They're in the pyramids. You'll see these. They're all throughout the Renaissance and the churches, everything. Well, this is sacred. Okay. So it's been that, around. Isn't that interesting that Tehetahedron goes in a cube at root three? Yeah, at root three. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, and so does the Chestahedron. What do you think they were? What do you think they were onto? Yes, yes. The Chestahedron also fits in at root three. Frank, what do you what do you think they were onto ten thousand years ago? The the with the, um, the ancient civilizations. Why did they have the flower of life inside of their art and as part of their lives? Because it was really fun to draw. It was great that it could put all these circles together. And it was not only that, what it was beautiful, but it affected you. It affects you. Yes, it affects your, like I said, it affects your dream life. It affects the moral forces in you. The moral forces. I mean, how do you, okay, yeah, you be more moral, buddy. Or my kid, I want you to be moral when you go to school. Oh, how the hell are you going to teach a kid to do that? But this is something tangible. Okay. That can actually practice and give them something that's hands-on that goes in here and that comes from the feeling life. And I will show you more and more how this is in the feeling life. The feeling, yes, yes. correct, yes. Okay. All right, so. This is also something I like to show. And what I can do is I can, I, mm -hmm. I can use this. You take uh, some Q-tips and you dip them in rubber cement. And when you do that, they stick together, kind of neat. You know, I mean, you can let go and there they are. So like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put six of them together because that makes a hexagram, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, st I'm still thinking about how you said that doing flowers of life can help with children and morality. That's very oh, interesting. Listen, the compass is really morality. The compass is the moral compass. You keep talking about a moral compass on, a, the yeah, internet, on the internet, you know, on the yeah. news. Compass moral. What the hell? They don't even know what they're talking about. They think it's a compass that's on a boat. It's not. Well, of course, you could also use it that way because it's also, you know. So if I take the hexagram. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm gonna put another one here. Why is the Pentagon the Pentagon? Say what is that again? Oh a question from the audience or from you, Ron? Yes. <coughs> Joe Pudding from Cleveland, Ohio asks, why, why is, is the Pentagon? Why the Pentagon. Why is the U I think the United States Pentagon? The Yes. That's a Pentagon. Yes. Yeah. What, why is why do you think the United States chose to make the Pentagon a Pentagon? 
Well, I don't know if I have an answer. It's good to, it's good to hear. I mean, I know about the pentagram, and I can tell you about it, and I'll show you right here how it's related to this chestahedron. So it could be part of sacred geometry is why it's a pentagon? Oh, absolutely. Pen, oh, pentagon. my gosh, yes. Yeah. See. What were, yeah. what were you going to show with that? Though? Well, no, I just have to set this down because okay. I need to get uh, this, this uh, stick here out of here so I can break it. I need to have something I can break. Okay. Okay. So here's, here's the pentagram. I haven't got it done yet, but almost. Now, that's a good question, and I want to answer it. Okay, so I can hold this up. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's what we've been drawing here. This, except I put the lines in here. But the reason I put the lines in here to show you that a, a root 3 is the distance between two equilateral triangles. Perfect. Well, let's see. Is that right? Am I correct? That is the distance between two equilateral triangles. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Same distance. All the way around. Same distance as root 3. So if I go back to the circles here, If I draw a line from here to here, here's root 3, and I connect this line, this line, this line, this line, they're equal triangles. They're just like these. Help me draw that? Huh? Is that, are we okay? Well, we, we also, let's, we also... I mean, root yeah. 3 is two equilateral triangles. I just want... Root 3 is two equilateral... Root 3 is. Okay, two equilateral triangles. Okay? Okay. All right. So if I put the root 3 in the middle of this pentagram, like that, in the middle, it makes a perfect cube. Yes. All those 12 edges are the same length. That's fantastic. Look. That's what's inside here. There's a cube in the middle of the chestahedron. You can't see it. It doesn't mean it's not there. And that's the sacred part of sacred geometry, is the parts that you can't see that are there. But you can draw and find out that they are there. Prove it. This is amazing. Okay. Oh, I did that. I wanted to do that. Now, so, I put this form into a circle. Like this one. See this circle right here? That's this circle. See this big triangle here? That's this one. I mean, it's hard for you to see, but Alan can tell you that it's true. He can see the lines I've scratched in. You see those lines that are, yeah. Yes. Etched in? Yes. Okay. All right. I hope you can see it. We I don't did. know if you we can. We just did. We just did. We showed them. Oh, okay. Okay. Now. Also, can you see these lines I drew in there? Very nice. Okay. All right. I love it. Okay. I think you can see them? Yeah. No, hard. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> I put these uh, yellow highlight marks. And that's where I put the chestahedron. There, 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 there. Right there is where the chestahedron is going through this plate. Yes, okay. So the yellow marks is where the chestahedron is entering through the plate. So the yellow marks right here is where the chestahedron is going through the plate. That's where it makes a six. Yes. This is based on six. Okay, and that's where it's going through. Yes. So the chestahedron is going through here on all six points. Yes. See, the camera is there, so now I can show the, like this. Can you see the six-pointed star? 
Good? No good? Ron's doing it, yep. Okay, I got it. So. This is the seat of light. And the chestahedron is going through exactly where the six-pointed star is that you saw, where you saw here. Okay. Okay, now when I look at this chestahedron in there, it's not in the middle. This distance from here to the base isn't as high as from the, the sphere or the disc to the top. Top. Mm -hmm. This distance is bigger, see that? Same thing here, from here to the top. Yeah, that's a good one. It's greater. In other words, from the green line down, it's a lot shorter, shorter than from the green line up. Yes, yes. No question. Yes. So I had to deal with this for a long time. Like, why is this? I don't like it. I want it in the middle. I can't cheat, whatever. So I had to live with it. And I lived with it for quite a while, like a year or so. Also, see the cube I put in there? That's what's in there. See the cube? So you know there is a cube based on what I did here with the, with the, tooth, with the Q tips. And you know that those are the holes of the smaller six pointed star inside, which is, this is sacred geometry. Okay, so I lived with this for a while until one day I decided, well, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this in a sphere. Yes. yes. And I wanted to get that sphere the same size as the disc and touch the top. Mm -hmm. Can you see the top right there? It's touching, yeah, yeah. Okay, so if I take the other half of the spear and put it on, since it's not as tall, all three points touch. Mm -hmm. All these three points down here touch the sphere as well as the top, and that's why it's not exactly in the middle, because its chestahedron is supposed to be in the middle of a sphere. Mm -hmm. And the six-pointed star is supposed to be in the middle of the equator, and it's also be supposed to be in the middle of the chestahedron. Now that is magic. Yeah. That is, that's unheard of. So, Who would ever have thought? So then, so then in, in another, uh, in, so w why this is magic then is because this is like Earth. That's and right. that See, you're getting ahead of me. Yes, okay, that's exactly okay. right. Okay. No, it won't come apart. You can yeah, hold correct. It and move it and so, the, the so the 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 um, the, the six-pointed star is at the equator. That's right. Six-pointed star is at the equator. That's right. And then the chestahedron is uh, has the perfect touch points with the edge of, of the sphere. Four points that touch the sphere also, and keeps it in the center so that the center of the chestahedron in a sphere has a six-pointed star right in the middle and right at the equator is a cube. Right at the equator is a cube. See the cube in there? Right at the center in the equator is a cube, yes. Now if I take the sphere and I put it into a cube, okay, if I take a sphere and put it into a cube, the outside of the sphere touches the very center of the, uh, right where the... Of the plane. Yeah, so I, remember how these were hitting? Okay, so, let's see if that's the best way to explain that. Um, all right, if you can see that the cube is, is right in the center and that there's a, there's a six-pointed star inside the cube. There is a six-pointed star inside the cube. There's also a six-sided cube into the chestahedron. If I put a sphere inside that little box, that little cube in there, the little cube, I put a sphere in there so that the edges of the sphere touch the faces of the cube, and I measure that in relationship to the outside, that sphere in the middle side is the size of the core of the Earth. You can go measure it. You go to any encyclopedia or any website, whatever, you'll see the size. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the cube in the very center is uh, proportionate to the size of our, the core of yes. the planet. Yes, that the scientists have found. And some scientists, or some in the Netherlands, 
that says that the, that the sphere in the center isn't really accurate. It's actually a cube in the center. It's a cube in the center. Yes, this is, this is scientific evidence that, I, that has nothing to do with my work. But my work shows why. Okay, so I'm going to put this over here. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, I can take it too. Okay. Right. okay. Now I'll pick up the chestahedron. Here's the okay. chestahedron here. And at the top of the chestahedron, there's a triangle, and the bottom is a triangle. So I have a black rubber band. You see that black rubber band? Okay, if I bring that black rubber band down, and the one on the bottom up, mm, yes, it will turn into right at the right point, which is right here with the chestahedron, it makes a perfect six-pointed star. Six-pointed star. Yes. And this is showing you how that works. Now the, mo the most important thing to realize is this, is that when the, when the triangle that comes down and the triangle that comes up twist in opposite directions, they go like this. Yes, yes. I'm so excited for this part. Frank, you still move so well. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Here's the chest of Hayden in the earth. Yeah. And these points right here all touch land masses. And this, of course, touches the South Pole. So I did a whole bunch of studies on maps to find out where all these different lines were, and it was very interesting. Interesting. It's right. Well, f well, at least from what it looks like, one <coughs> touches, one touches around Rome, one touches around uh, Denver, one touches around Tokyo. Yeah, one touches uh, Kansas. This is where Dorothy came from. That's where all the hurricanes go, right? Uh, oh, oh. That's right. Oh, because that one's kind of moving a little bit in the center of the U.S. So if oh that's no, Kansas, that thing it shouldn't be moving. No. But if it's around Kansas, but that's Kansas. That's kind of interesting. That's where Dorothy was. Which Kansas is a very massive that's tor tornado, tornado alley. That's Tornado Alley, yeah. And all you have to do is to follow that line right up, and it goes right where Tornado Alley goes. And then what happens? It hits Kansas, and then it turns that direction. And go on the internet, look. You can follow the tornado, go. Follow the edges. Follow the edges. Follow the yellow brick road. Interesting, so you can follow the the edges of, Follow the edges. of, of, of the, t oh, but, but then what about the other edges where it what goes up edges? through, well, what about the other edges where oh, it goes up through? Oh, they're very like interesting. The, I did a, uh, studies of the, the east coast of Asia. Yeah. Like yeah. ones on the east coast of Asia. Yeah, because see, some of these are sucking and some of them are under pressure. Some, some, depending on which line you follow, one is pressure and one is suction. Opposites, uh -huh. polarities. Oh. Sure, sure, okay. Just like within the heart, the pressure and the suction. Yes. Interesting. So then it could be part of the ring of fire here with the volcano? It is the ring of fire. All you have to do is lay it out on a map. The ring of fire goes across here on that line. What about the one that is coming through kind of like a... Uh, I don't know. Some of, that, some of it's interesting. I can't explain everything, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Uh, yeah. Okay, and then the but other I mean, one's Antarctica. I mean, after all, I mean, Antarctica. you know, what I'm stating is pretty, you know, uh, 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 be weird, be happy, it says over there. Well, That's I'm right. That's being right. weird and being happy. Okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay. so what I did here is I put the chest of heater into a sphere, and I cut a hole in the bottom of the chestahedron. And the reason I do that is because if I take a chestahedron and I spin it, it makes a hole. Oh, and this is where we have the second part of that video that you want? The, the yeah, not the quite bell? yet. Okay, not yet with the bell, okay. okay. But see that hole? I made that hole in there. Uh-huh. See? I'm not okay, guessing. So Okay, so when you spin a, test, uh, a chestahedron, what are, we, what are we seeing when you spin this? Well, when you, when you spin it, then you're seeing that the Earth is turning, okay? And so there is a triangle in the top of this form that turns into a circle. Okay. And that circle has a relationship 
to the sphere of the earth because these points touch. All right, so what I did was, is I find, find the cone that would fit in that. Don't spill it yet for the bell. We'll wait till the bell. Okay. Now here we go. Okay. If I drop a cone into here, I made the red part right there. You could see that it, come, that it comes through. The little red point hits there. So this cone right here is what goes from the top of that circle to the point. Okay. So, if I take this apart, and I want to, it has scotch tape on it. I want to take it apart because there's something amazing here going on again that is amazing. I don't know how to get this thing off. Well, that scotch tape works really mm -hmm, good. Mm -hmm. But keep, anyway. Keep teaching. I'll get this off. To get the, the, this cone into a point, I had to make a little one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this is amazing. This is what's so amazing about this form. Look at this. I put this in here, right? Look at that. All right. So I made another cone where these two, these three touch, and these three touch. Can you see that? Yes. Huh? Yes. So you, this cone touches three, it actually touches six points. Right? And take this out. Same cone. Uh huh. No, this is amazing. Who would have ever thought that was the same size cone? Uh huh. So what it means is, is that there's a cone that goes around this as the Earth is spinning. Ah. Uh. That is parallel to each other. Look, they're parallel. Uh huh. Okay. So that means there's going to be energy that comes in, and energy that comes out. Okay. So it can go in, and out. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Now, which is one of the reasons why we uh, no. Here we go. Here comes some more of this stuff that drives okay. lots of people nuts because I'm it, it, you speculating have, you on have something. You have to have this bidirectional, yeah, bidirectionality. Yeah, that's, that's right. Like an Earth, like a heart, it has to have bidirectionality. Okay. Now this is amazing. Here, watch some more stuff coming here. Put it back together. It's back together. You see this ring right here? Mm -hmm. That makes from the cone? Mm -hmm. It's exactly the size of that ring. Oh yeah, yeah. Those oh. rings are the same size. Which is what's? Uh, it's a balanced. Below. Here are those rings. Oh, this is the aurora. Yeah. The aurora. Yeah, borealis. Yeah, yeah. Now it's interesting because this is the aurora at the North Pole. Yep. The South Pole. Okay. Never in any of the aurora pictures that you see is this ever. Uh, is there ever a flash of any kind of light that goes in the middle? Yeah. Never. Yeah. There's uh, never. Interesting. On the other end. You have light that goes across. Uh huh. Why? Because this point is here. Oh. And, and it's flowing across into the other cone, which is about right here, right? Mm -hmm. And it's coming out. And you notice this is the other size of the larger cone underneath, and that's where the aurora borealis is between the top cone and the bottom cone. Mm hmm. And that's why. It gets lined up like this, and it gets swerved over more as an oval. Mm. <clears throat> Interesting. So that the the chestahedron in the center has of of Earth has even uh, has to do with the auroras. Yes. Yeah. It does. The way that the Earth breathes. Exactly. Now here's the thing about this: is that the scientists don't know. They don't know this. They cannot figure out there isn't any explanation for this opening at the top being all black with a ring around it and the bottom part with a ring that doesn't, the aurora doesn't go on the outside of it but stays inside. No one can explain that. No one. I've looked and looked and looked and looked. Okay. So,
These are pretty subjective speculations, but it's based a little bit on a lawfulness too. There's a little, there's a, my form is lawful. So some of the things that I can explain lawfully, other people can't. You can't, you can't dispute that. You can't dispute those cones, sorry. Yeah. They're honest, it's a moral uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. This is not immoral. Mm -hmm. All right. Because they're reproducible over and over again. Yes, this is all about it. And why is this all about it? Because this is the human heart geometry. This is all about the heart, you guys. If I take the chestahedron and I tell you that it's, that it sits in the body like this, you're going to say, no heart looks like this. The geometry doesn't look like this. But geometry is the way that you design something. It's not the end result. Between the idea and a result of a manifestation in our, in our world, there's a design. There's a drawing. All right. And so if I take this and I blow a bubble in this, this is what it looks like. If you take it and blow a bubble in it, yeah. yeah. All I have to do is dip this into soap. You could do it at home. Dip it into soap. Blow a bubble, and this is what the bubble looks. This is called minimum surfaces. This is the way nature tries to become a sphere when it's just geometry, it's straight lines. Mm -hmm. All geometric forms, and this one especially, all of them, cubes, whatever, are all trying to become a sphere. It's called minimum surfaces. This is the shape of the left ventricle of the human heart. And we have a, the eight, that eight I second have a, video, Ron. I have a picture here of the human heart and this is the left ventricle this and, is the right ventricle and we have this too which is the digital asset oh my trying. gosh yes i've got this ron can you pause it quick too at the very end maybe you okay. can wait a little bit before you show that okay okay then let's keep it going here then okay. yeah wait, wait a little bit on that okay all right all right so if i cut off the left ventricle here of the right ventricle and i remove it i'll hold this quick okay. this is what's left this is the human heart and this is the form that, he's, that the, Alan is holding. So there isn't any geometry that I've seen, and I've studied this karyotic studies that uh, heart researchers do on trying to explain what the geometry is behind the human heart. And the closest they come up is with a form they call a prolate. But this, the prolate has a point on both ends. This doesn't. This is flat across, just like this. So that's one thing that you can't say that uh, that the geometry isn't organic. It is. It can be organic on a natural process. But just the left ventricle, you said, not. This is the left ventricle. And what about the right? Well, the right is of just a hedron that has collapsed on one side, and it hugs this one. Okay. And I have geometry studies showing that. Okay. How that works. Okay. One of the reasons, one of the ways I figured out this was the heart, because I, I, I didn't find out it was a heart for seven, eight years. I study, study, study. And I, t I saw a model of a heart, and I noticed at the, at the apex, this is called the apex, this is called the base. At the apex, it had kind of three ridges at the bottom. And then when the ridge came up, it flattened out. Ah, uh, then I knew I might be on it. Mm -hmm. I might be on something. Mm -hmm. So, the next thing I did, did was I tried to find out that this, uh, the heart, this is the heart, this is the geometry of the inside and the outside of the heart. If you put this into a cube, it's at root three, as, as you know, mm -hmm. and it sits in the body like this. Oh, it does? Yes. And so it's not, so it does sit at this root three angle. It doesn't sit up. Look at that. Look how it sits. Sitting at a root three angle like that. It sits at root three. Interesting. So, this is the apex and this is the base. And that is an angle of root three. And why is it? Why would the 
whoever did this, why would they set it at root 3? And the reason is because root 3 is the balance. I'll show you here. Root 3 is the balance between forward and backwards, right and left, and top to bottom. Not root 2. Mm. Root 2 is two-dimensional. The heart sits at an angle like this. And no heart explanational process that's ever been developed has shows that the heart sits at anything else than root 3. And mm. why? Because it was in a cube. Why? Because it was a tetrahedron that was spun, okay? And the tetrahedron is known as warmth, okay? And the tetrahedron, or the chestahedron, is between a cube and an octahedron. The cube is earth, and the octahedron is air. The heart sits in the middle of the chest, uh, below the lungs. Mm -hmm. The octahedron is known as the kidneys. So the heart sits between the kidneys and the lungs. Geometrically, in the platonic forms, I had even nothing to do with inventing. Let me know when you're ready for that video, too. Now, this is the geometry of the inside of the heart. So the inside of the heart looks like looks like that, like this one here. Mm -hmm. Now remember, this is the inside of the heart. This is where the, this is the blood, really. The heart has really got a cavity, and this is what's in the cavity. And what happens, and that is, this is in the research. I've got a, a website you can go to called Heartistic Science. And in there, I have research done by cardiologists, researchers, that say, well, why is it that the top doesn't move, the midsection moves, and the apex doesn't hardly move at all? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Look. Yeah. That's these two circles going from the top to the bottom. That, this is very important, everyone. Unbelievable. Can you see the six-pointed star? Yeah. This isn't, this isn't, this is coming from this work. It's not coming from me. I'm not making this stuff up. This is what the, okay. This form is a communicational device. And it, in a way, speaks to me. It tells me, once I find something in it, that there's something else also. And then there's something else also. Bum, bum. Bum, bum. Bum, bum. That's right. Bum, bum. Heartbeat. Here. Heartbeat. Bump, Heartbeat. Bump, 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 bump. The only thing that this doesn't show, this one, is that this spins like that. Oh yeah, correct. It spins. Now, now you can show this. Show, okay, great. Now we can show the video as we're we're explaining um, the bump, 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 bump of the heartbeat. Um, I want to have um, in this asset that's coming up. This was at Frank's house when uh, Brock took us over there. And, and you can see the bump, 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 bump. And Ron, why don't you go ahead and pause it like right around? Yeah, sure. Go All ahead. Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the green one is yeah. this one. I was just holding oh, up. Yeah, yeah. Where'd it so, go? Um, Here. Yeah, okay. Yes. This is the green one. And it's bowed out, and you can see the geometry behind it. See it? All right. Can, can you stop it? Oh, stop it. All right. So. This is the bowed out one. This is the chestahedron. This one here is this one. You can see this triangle here. Yeah. It's up at the top. And then it's got this big spike like this, which is really two equilateral triangles stretched out. So as you turn this, this spins. And this goes up and down a little bit, but not much. See how the outside goes up and down a little bit? Mm -hmm. Not much. It doesn't twist like this. Yeah. Look, yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't twist. Yeah, not much. Not no, much. no, not much. Yeah, barely okay. any. There's basically, the form of the chestahedron is just what enables it to go just barely enough of a... That's a geometry. The yeah. sacred geometry. The sacred geometry. The sacred just barely of enabling our human heart. of our human heart. Yeah, yeah. Now, show, this is this one that, that Alan's showing in minimum surfaces. So that's the shape of the blood. Okay? And that's the shape of the outside of the heart, and that's the inside of the heart. 
Okay, let's see if we can get it to turn. The outside of the heart and the inside of yes. the heart. Okay. That's a hollow space inside. Yeah. Awesome. And then Ron's playing there it again. Turning. Ron's playing it again for us. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. And there's exactly. the turning. See how it blows out a little bit? This yeah. one twists. Look. This one goes blows out just a little bit. Yeah, and this one twists. Is yeah. that cool or what? Yeah. Now this happens. This pulsation, it happens nine tenths of a second throughout your whole life. It happens in nine tenths of a second every second. Every second. You get about two and a half billion heartbeats in a lifetime. Now, this is what's really cool. 82. That this design of this heart is based on sacred geometry. All of these drawings here are done with that stick. Okay, it wasn't done with a big compass I had. It was done with a stick. And I refined it with, this, with the big compass. Okay, but basically all this comes from sacred geometry. No measurements. There are no rulers. There's just straight sticks. Yeah. Now, the heart is, a lot of people now are saying the heart isn't a pump. I don't know if you've heard this, but a lot of people say that the heart doesn't pump the blood. Okay. Okay, well, and what does it do? Okay, you're telling me it's not a pump. Okay, well, then what is it? Mm -hmm. So from, according to my research, this speaks to me. Like I told you, this speaks to me. Now, when, uh, uh, this, this is pretty good. We could come back to it again. Do you right? want to do the bell now? I want to do the bell now. Okay, that's the second half of that. Yeah, great. Okay, this is really cool because it shows the chestahedron. There it is. And then it, it comes out of the, of the big one. Once it reaches its point where it's like this, the blue part is like this, yep. right there. It will come out. It comes out. Yep. And then it goes over here, top view, nice, huh? Yep. And then I had him spin it. Yes. And when you spin it, it turns into a bell. It turns into a bell, okay, yes. And of course, then I made some, a design of a bell, and that's the design I made on top of the bell. But this is the bell. So the chestahedron, when it spins, it turns into a bell. Now. And what is the purpose of, yeah, of that bell? This is what happened. I found this, and this really changed everything for me. I found this photograph of a temple in Egypt. And this is called the Temple of Hathor. How do uh, I spell that? Hathor? Hepper. Hathor. Hap. Ha -hap. Hepper. Hepper. The H Temple of Hopper. H A P O R? Hapor? No, I'm not sure. I okay. think it's. Hepper. Yes, H A P. L E R, my, 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 it was Hopper, ha, ha, Temple of Hepper. Temple Hepper. I have been talking so much, and I have a uh, dry mouth. And you have so water right there. I start Hathor, my, H, -A -T -A H A T H O R. Okay, I have time, hard time pronouncing some of my words after I talk for a long time. Hathor, interesting. And we have the NDI if you want to show it. <laughs> Here it is, I did. Okay, great. And the top of this is her temple is a birthing temple where women go to give birth at, at 4,000 years ago. Okay. And they go into this temple. And on the ceiling, there is a princess. And the, it's a princess face. Her arms are coming down here. Her body's here, bends in her legs. Here's her feet. Oh, okay. And she is known. Do you okay, see that, Ron? As, yeah. Yeah, the arms on the, on the right side, and she's bending over, and the legs are on the left side, and the, it's a bent over with the arms down there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So she, uh, the, goddess is, the goddess is called Princess Newt. Newt. And Newt swallows the moon, and nine months later gives birth to the sun. Oh, wow. And from the sun, all these bells come down, to a cube. So immediately I knew that my form, 
made these bells. Oh, the bell is uh, for the birth. The bell is the heart. Is the heart. We incarnate with our heart, not with our fingers, not with our ears, not with our kidneys. We incarnate into this world, into an embryo, through the heart. That's what carries our karma, that's what carries our goals, that carries our plans, the human heart, which we're talking about here with the chestahedron. So, I mean, look at these. Can Where were see? these? Where were these? These are the bells enlarged. Oh, those are the bells. This, oh. I enlarged this piece. Oh, I see what you did. Yeah, so you yeah, could okay. see that these are bells. Yes. These are human hearts incarnating. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, now you're going to say, well, that guy is really nuts. Because now look what he's saying. <laughs> we like them. The more nuts, the better. More nuts than ever now. <laughs> so the thing is, is that we incarnate with our heart. So that means that, therefore, okay, what we take in our heart in this life is what we take out. And what we bring back in to do again. Wow. Now. So be very vigilant with what. What's that? Be very vigilant and careful with what you take into your heart in this life. Yeah, and what you do in your life. The moral part of your life. This is, is affecting. Because this is an interval. And an intro is between polarities. And polarities is everything that we experience on this earth is all polarity. I mean, I'm not kidding you, there isn't a thing. So the life and the death are the, are the polarities and the interval is the time in, the, in between. It's heart. Is, is heart, yes. yes. Okay. It's the okay. organ that balances polarities. The organ it's not balances a pump. polarities. <laughs> I'm not kidding, it's not a pump. So here, if you, if you find my compass wow. again, wherever it went, here it is. An organ that balances polarities. This is a moral compass. It has the polarities. Everything on earth is polarities. And intervals. And what? And intervals. And an interval between them. And this is where we live. This is our life from here to here. Wow. This is in our life. This is in our life. This is birth. This is death. But in this interval is what we do here on our planet. And what we have to do is try to find the interval in our life to be able to balance these. And what does that is the human heart. The human heart balances polarities and is an interval. And it's an interval between octahedron and a cube. It's an interval between the lungs and the kidneys. Remember that the heart takes up, there are six, six lobes in the human heart. One of those lobes the heart takes. So there's five left. So this interval right here, if we get our heart stuck on this side or on this side, we have what we know as heart attacks. And these heart attacks are either congestive. Mm. They're both congestive, but this one gets big, and this one shrinks. Mm. And that depends on what side you're on. If you're going to be stuck on a polarity, you better find some way to get out of it. Because everything on this earth is set up to be polarities. That's why the earth is known as what is different. What's different between this side and this side. And what's different between the two is the heart in the middle of the cube. Yeah. And what is it doing? It's spinning like this. Yes. It's going to this side, then it goes to this side. The boom. Less than one second, your entire life. Nine tenths of a second. Boom, 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 boom. Yes. Boom. And now you can actually explain some of these things that people talk about uh, in their meditations and in whatever, whatever that they do. Now this is more subjective, even though some people may think it's too subjective. But remember that the human heart is balancing between the subjective and the objective. It's balancing between math and art. And in between here is the combination and uh, Einstein said that the highest form of math is art, mm. and the highest form of art is mathematical. Yes, he's saying here, mm. this is the interval. So what we have to do in this life is to work with the interval and help it balance everything that's different, good and bad, um, male and female, all the opposites that are all throughout our life from birth to death, 
the human heart is trying to balance. We go back to one. And only on earth can you do this. And only on earth can you develop a capacity. Only on earth can you develop the heart. And on the other side, you can't help develop the heart, but you can plan for how you can develop it. And then you can incarnate. And there's one philosopher that says that the human heart, before it incarnates, are spinning bells at high speeds, going all over the place, looking for the right parents, right environment, right situation wow. for, your, for its development. And the heart, the heart itself, and that's another reason why I like this so much, is that these Egyptians had clairvoyance. We don't. Mm -hmm. We've lost a lot. They, of it. Oh, we lost it. And you know, we lost it for a good reason because we needed to develop our senses. We needed to develop our thinking, our feeling, our willing. We needed to develop our senses. And we couldn't do that during this time because everything was coming through us. Mm. Now things have to come from us. Mm. So, the human heart, okay is what allows all this to happen. And you choose your parents. You choose the environment that you come into because you've got certain things to do that certain environments can help. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's you, what we're looking you for. You come with a mission into Playground Earth. We do. Now this is what's really cool. The heart enters the embryo, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. about two weeks. Two weeks into about, about two weeks gestation. into the after inception. Yeah. And the heart, okay, is outside the body. Just like this. The heart's outside of the body yeah. when it's first? It's outside the embryo. Oh, wow. And then it enters in. Wow. And underneath the chin like this, and then it enters in. But before that, the heart's out here. It's coming in. Oh. Before the, uh, uh, the body, okay, already has blood and veins in it that are pulsating without the heart. Mm. And then, wow. the blood in, your, in the embryo is 100% independent of the mother's blood. That blood is the baby's blood, has nothing to do with the mother. That's your, that's your blood, that's your heart, and that's your blood. And what goes through the heart is the blood, and that's what's driving the heart is the blood. The heart isn't driving the blood. The blood is driving the heart. Okay, and all of this is coming from what this geometry tells me. It talks to me in a way that I can understand geometrically what possibilities are. I mean, they don't even know the geometry of the bell. I took this to a bell expert. He about, he about fell off his chair when I spun it. He says, we don't, we, we're Russians and we know the, the best, we, we, we make the best bells. I said, well, how'd you do it then? You didn't have this. He says, trial and error. This is not trial and error. Yeah. So this is what I do. So, and I have some other things about the human heart. That's really neat. I figured out how the blood runs through the heart. Okay. What's amazing is the blood comes into the heart clockwise and leaves counterclockwise. Mm. Opposite. You see what I mean by polarities? Mm. Clockwise, counterclockwise. Coming out of our heart, out of the chetahedron. Look, I figured out how to do that. Mm -hmm. There's no gears in here. There's no pulleys. There's not a bunch of springs. There's, um, there, there's uh, uh, pulleys or so gears it, or. So, com so coming in. I'm saying clockwise. Coming in, going out. Yes. In, out. Here. In, out. In. And this is twice the size as this. And yet the speed that goes through the heart, coming in and going out at the same speed, yet this is half the size of this. So our heart captures our karmic 
what happens in the in the life and stores it for the next uh, it, it carries the the life it carries the life because it's between birth and death and between those is life, life an yes. interval is life an interval is life between birth and death and what is accumulated through experience to the heart carries on through spirit into next absolutely liver. it doesn't go out through your liver what is the brain's role in uh, the interval? A brain, uh, well, the brain isn't an interval. Okay, the heart is. Brain is, is an organ. Is an organ. Yeah, I mean, even though the heart is an organ too. But the heart has, the heart is more the feeling life or the brain is more conception, perception. It's more the thinking realm. Okay. And the heart's on the feeling realm. Uh, the heart is in the soul realm. The soul it's realm. It's the soul. You have the soul, and this is the thinking realm. So, and this out here is the will. Oh, it's this. This is what I do. My will is driving me. I have a very strong will. And the and the chestahedron being inside of, being inside of Earth. This is the Earth's heart beat. That's right. Now, you go on the internet, put in Aurora Borealis, and there's some Aurora Borealis images from outer space that NASA has taken that shows the Aurora, and the, 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 the Earth is quite small. And the Aurora at the top is moving like this. This is so perfect. The Aurora is moving counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise, yeah. clockwise, counterclockwise. Look at it. Right there in front the of The aurora moves like this as it does. well. It has also, wow. it has a pulse. We just interviewed an, a NASA. What's that? We, we just interviewed a, a, a NASA astronaut that spent 50 days in space, and we should have asked uh, if we would have known. Now we will that know. Been great. That now we know to ask about the way the aurora All you've got to do is go on the internet and shows it. A video of oh, it. Oh, yeah. Shows it doing this. And that's the heartbeat of the Earth. It is. You see, another thing that the form has taught me, that the scientists, well, I don't know if they agree or disagree, I don't know. But the aurora, okay, that you see, okay. It's coming out of the heart. Coming out of the, of the Earth and not coming in. It comes in through the black hole, but it leaves. So the aurora that you see, okay, is leaving. That's not entering. The aurora is always leaving? Always? No, it comes in. It comes in. Uh huh. Then it hits the bottom of a point. It goes across and back up. So when you see this aurora here, it's coming out of the earth. Yes. This one. Yes. This one is still in the center, reaching to go up out. Well, this isn't coming in, this is going out. Did you have any idea the chestahedron was related to the heart and to the earth? And uh, uh, did you have any inkling? Any? In, did, the, did you have any bites of that it was showing you that, or was it all? All this has come from me. Yeah, yeah. I now have a mentor that's teaching me. Yes, yes. The the mentor I have is a chestahedron. Yeah, yeah. That's my mentor. You were finding the seven. By finding the seven, I had no clue what it was. It took me, I think it took me seven to eight years before I even had an inkling that it was a heart. And then I've been working ago. 12 years on, on, is it the heart? Yeah. Seven, eight years to even find the chestahedron and then about 12 years to figure out that it has to deal with the heart and the earth. Well, to get evidence. To get evidence. To get evidence. Yeah. Um, uh, the Chestahedron, you know, I have a lot of people, I have some people that say it's not accurate. I have mathematics in my book that shows it's exactly accurate. I mean, I mean all these things that come at you, and so I'm sticking my neck out, right? Well, I don't care. What the hell, I don't care if I stick out my neck. Pro disprove me. Come on, tell me where I'm wrong. I want, give me some advice. Yeah. I get zero. Yeah. And I'm not a nut, you know, I mean, I, I have children, uh, uh, you know, this is, 
geometry. This isn't some fantasy thing I'm going through here. Yeah, yeah. And you walked us through the twig on the beach and how you can make the seed of life and the flower Absolutely. of life. Absolutely. I showed you how to make a chest of with a twig. Yeah. yeah. Okay? A twig with a branch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, That's why I, sorry, I, I, I wasn't as accurate as if I used the regular compass, mm -hmm. but I wanted to em emphasize that this is sacred. And that's, that twig will make perfect circles if it was in the sand not on this piece of paper with an eraser. But it did make it, it did show it, even though I, the twig wasn't very accurate. That's my fault, not the twig. Uh, Frank, I wanna know what you, uh, th th what, do you, what, do you what do you think do, about, do you think that the sacred geometries and chestahedrons, do you think this is our ticket to having that global unity that we need to work together? The secret to that global unity is the heart, but it's based on, the, on that person's soul forces. It's a soul organ. It's based on that. But if the more that you understand the heart and the geometry and actually try to practice it with a stick or a real compass, the more it'll make you healthier in your view. Yeah. You'll become more healthy in your thinking. Not that you're going to become smarter, you're going to get dumb or whatnot. None of that. It's that you'll become more healthy so that you can handle the polarities because they're everywhere. Do not get stuck with one of them. Know that the heart will help you balance it. It's all about you, you know. The blood is you and it runs through the heart and that, that's going to help. This will help humanity in the end somehow. Yes, yes. I'm not going to be here when it does, but um, somehow this geometry came in. I, uh, I almost died of a heart problem. I had two brothers that died of heart problems. So, and my name is Chester, which is a chest. And I call it a chestahedron because it's a, this is a, a, a hedron, a polyhedron in the chest. Yes, yes. So I came in. One of the things that you look at is to figure out why you came here. What was the purpose? Well, one of the things that you can do to find out closer to what you came here to do is to look at your parents and find out what they were good at, not what they became or any yeah. of that kind of stuff. What they were good at. But what they were good at. And that's the reason you chose them. And that has something to do about your choice or why you came here. This there's still so much to, to, to talk about regarding that. Oh my gosh, oh, I'm, I could talk forever yeah. on this. This is what I do, this is my life. This is my <laughs> interval. I'm living my interval. You, what's, what else is good is that you, uh, even though like you just said that the chestahedron may, uh, uh, may, it may take time past your lifetime, um, you've done what you've needed to do with passing this information on to young people will continue awakening and inspiring to this this information oh, to I the heart so. to the unity to even something as simple as to the twig with the branch to be able to make the flower of life and um the seed of life, seed and, of life. yeah fruit of life the fruit the tree of, life. of life and 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 the chestahedron from that like, yeah the, the, the main thing is to understand here is that all of this that i have done is not traditional this is the future the future isn't looking at the flower of life or whatever. It's the, the, why that exists is to teach you what happened in the past so you can take that and go into the future. This is the future. And I've given you ways that I found this that can be applied that I haven't seen anybody apply. Nobody's taking the chest, nobody's taking the platonic forms and spinning them. None of, nobody's opened them up. And I've been doing this for 20 years and I've put everything, I have 192 videos on YouTube to give away my work, to try to get people to stop making flower of life and taking crayons or felt pens and coloring them in different. Uh, that's just not it. That's not worth. That's uh, the past has been left for you for a good reason. He, the spiritual world left all the nature here, the trees, the animals, whatever. And they took off. They said, okay, now we'll see what you can do. How about give them back to us a little bit? That's what I tried to do. I'm trying to give back because I can take this across the threshold. Yeah. They don't have this on the other side. 
it can only be developed on earth. And that's why it's so important. Your life is so important because you need to take something back and give back for your life. And that has to be done on Earth, not on some other planet or some other solar system or other galaxy. It has to be done here on Earth where everything is different. This is where you can be different and you can be different in a productive way and you can choose anything. You don't have to just choose geometry. You could choose anything that you can develop yourself. And the only thing you could cross the threshold with and go to the other side whenever that happens is your capacity. And capacity can only be bought here. Across the, across the threshold, and you cannot develop your capacity. Frank, this has been such a fascinating time together. I'm really grateful for oh, you. Yeah, I'm so happy that Thank I can you. share it. Thank you. You've allowed Thank me you. to share Thank it. You. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. My God. <laughs> very welcome. We're, we're, we're so very welcome. welcome. We're so Thank grateful. you. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing everything that you've shared this throughout this conversation. Um, Thank you, Ron, for producing and directing. We're very grateful for you. Thank you. And Can I show Ron one thing? He asked me about the Pentagon. Okay with that? Sure. Yeah, here's the Pentagon. Yes. Now, if I take this one arm of the Pentagon here and I slip it under this one, I take this one here and go like this, it looks like this. Mm hmm. It's becoming three-dimensional. Now, if I take and slip another one under, another arm, it's the chestahedron. The chestahedron is based on the five-pointed star, wow. the pentagram. These are arms off the pentagram. Three of the arms, three of these arms, you take any pentagram you want to draw, draw it accurate, and take three of these off, fold them together, you get the chestahedron, and when you take it together and you glue it and you set it down, it makes a triangle at the bottom and the same size on the sides. There. I found other ways to find this. This form is outstanding. It's unbelievable how much there is, and there's still things I haven't shown you than how I also discovered it. We'll have to have you back. There's a, there's a lot to, to con there's so much to continue un oh, I know. understanding got... about sacred geometry. Oh. You've given us so many important pointers and tips that hopefully for other people has resonated. This is for other people. Yes, yes, correct. That's what we do every episode. Every episode is for others to get engaged it's and inspired with, yes, yes. It's the future. Frank, thank you again so much for coming on the show. We're yeah, so grateful. Thanks for thank putting you. up with all my talk. We loved it. We loved it. Um, I want to give, it, again, a huge thank you to Ron Vogus for producing and directing. Huge thank you to the viewers for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know. Uh, also, check out the link below to frankchester.com and go and have more conversations with your friends, your family, your coworkers online on social media. Get talking about the Chestahedron, about sacred geometry, get practicing it together. Let's get there together, everyone. Support the organizations, the entrepreneurs, the artists around the world that you believe in. Support simulation. Our links are below. Let's get inspired to that unity. And Go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon.